So uh, I have a very strict way without getting too serious about things, uh, but it requires an intense amount of attention. So, uh, and we are adults, so, you know, when it's time to sit down, let's go ahead and sit down and not have the side chatter. We got too much to go through to be interrupted, which, which means also, uh, I talked to a few people outside, uh, as, as I'm talking, yes. Oh, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to hold off on questions. Write down your questions. You got plenty of uh, space in the back of your book, and when we end a point, we'll go over those questions before we go on to the next point. So everybody got that? Okay. There's, there's still a little bit of misunderstanding here, so I got to go a little deeper into the deed of trust. Raise your hand if you understand, not whether or not you believe, okay, but if you understand my concept of the exchange of the note for the house. If you understand that, so, it, all right, if you don't understand that, raise your hand. Okay, we're going to work in the, the negatives on this. You don't understand that? Oh, I'm sorry, you just got here. Okay, uh, so now we're going to discuss the deed of trust. Yes, for the most part, a deed of trust and a mortgage, other than some concepts of title, are basically the same thing. The deed of trust has a whole lot of legalese. Wherefores, whereases, therefores, whatever you want to call them. And it's all bunk. It's filler. Every bit of it's bunk. Has nothing to do with anything. There's even something on page two, paragraph H, that says, as evidenced by the note. Where'd the deed of trust go? Where'd the note go? Where's the evidence? There isn't any. There isn't any. As evidenced by the note. <laughs> You're going to believe me or your lying eyes? As evidenced by nothing. Cindy actually discovered that, so thank her for that one. That The concept being, we have this thing called a deed of trust. Now, they use one of the clauses in the deed of trust called a power of sale clause to commence the foreclosure action. Whether you're in a non-judicial or judicial state doesn't matter. The way that they are foreclosing is pursuant to a power of sale clause. We know that from, we being the people that I work with know that better than anybody. Because with our new documents, hammering these attorneys, they're coming out and they're listing the, the jurisprudence, the stare decisis, the case precedents, whatever you want to call it, showing that a foreclosure has nothing to do with the redemption of the note. And there's a lot of it out there. Now, you never saw any of that while you're all using that show me the note argument because they, they wanted you to keep saying show me the note because it can't work. So the deed of trust, all of those bizarre arguments in there and statements notwithstanding, is nothing more than a simple contract. If I say, Nancy, you're looking lovely this morning, but you're a little... You're a little dead looking, a little tired. You dress nice, but the eyes ain't sparkling, sunshine. You want to buy a bottle of this? So, is that deal done? I specifically performed. We went into, pursuant to Blue Moon Contracts of 1892, the foundational doctrine for all contracts in American jurisprudence, we 
have gone into a contract. I made her an offer. Do you want to buy this? She said, yes, I do. She accepted my offer. Is the deal consummated? Did I specifically perform? I'm good at that. <laughs> Never mind. I'm a dancer. What can I say? So I've specifically performed. What must she now do? Are we done? And remember, I make the big money. I did. I made it on the printer. So it's all kosher, right? Everything's cool. And we're done. Now, when I offered Nancy the little bottle of, and somebody told me this has bat guana in it. Can't read without my glasses, so I don't know. I'll tell you whether it tastes like that or not later. Uh, when, when I gave her that bottle, I specifically performed. When she failed to give me the money, she failed to specifically perform. Does she have any further rights in this negotiation until she gives me the money? No, no, no. Now she could have, when we were back like this, when I go, Nancy, Nancy, come on, we got a lot of work to do. Uh, let's, let's pick it up a notch. Let me show you this. I don't know, legalized cocaine or whatever it is, berry flavor, and, and you'll be jumping around the room like a three-year-old eating ice cream. So, uh, how about $10 for it? But, see, you don't want to pay 10 See, See, now we can negotiate, right? But once she did this, once she took it, she can no longer negotiate. Do we understand that? That is a foundation of law. Whether you look at, you know, concepts like uh, creditors in commerce or commercial law or there again, bloom on contracts. How many people are real estate agents or in real estate? Okay. We know offer and counter offer law quite well, right? When you make an offer, if the other person accepts it, we're done. You better fulfill. We call that specific performance in real estate law. It's a little different in contract law, but we'll just stick with specific performance. So she took it. She must therefore give me the full amount, the full amount. She can't take it and then renegotiate because if she only gave me half, then she half performed. Do we understand that? So... In your negotiations over the deed of trust, did you present the adversary with the deed of trust? Yes, you gave it to them. So therefore, did you specifically perform? Did they give you a loan? They never gave you the loan. So what rights do they have in these negotiations? None. None. Everything they do from this point on is criminal. It's fraud in the factum and fraud in the inducement. The fraud in the inducement stems from the concept that they were tricking you. Uh, hold on for just a minute. Write the question down. We'll get to that. The fraud in the inducement came from making you believe that you were going to receive a loan, that it had something to do with the note or the property, blah, blah, blah. The fraud and the factum, the factual aspects of the fraud, came when they failed to perform. There's a lot of different concepts of fraud. You need to understand which ones are involved here. There's fundamentally four elements, usually nine elements of fraud that you use in law. Uh, you must be specific when you sue on fraud. We don't really have to worry about that here, but you need to understand there's different kinds of fraud. 
they committed fraud in the inducement by lying to you that somehow this deed of trust has something to do with the note and the property and therefore you must sign it in order to get the house. The fraud and the factum came when you did sign the deed of trust and gave it to them and they never gave you the loan. Now there's been people that have paid off their deed of trust and still never got the loan. <laughs> that the way the law is written, fraud, statute of limitations means that the time ran out to litigate over something. So the statute of limitations on fraud starts when you discover the fraud. You'll have a lot of lawyers tell you there is no statute of limitations on fraud. I just don't buy that. Jurisprudence tells us if you wait too long to aggressively assert your rights, you've lost them. So if you found out 20 years ago you never got a loan and you're waiting now to sue them, you're probably not going to be successful. If you found out last week that the whole thing was bunk, so now you sue them for the money, well, okay, I don't care if that loan was 20 years ago. It was fraud 20 years ago. It's fraud today. Fraud is fraud. <sighs> Maxims of law have been developed for the last basically 1,200 years. And maxims of law are what dictates the, the behaviors in accordance with laws. And under, in other words, if you commit perjury in a court case, there's a maxim of law that says once a liar, always a liar. So if you commit fraud, there's also a maxim that says once fraud, always fraud. So once the bank commits the fraud against you, the only way that they can restore their concept of what in law is called clean hands is to fulfill their obligation and to make you whole. In other words, anything you lost because of their fraud and that sort of thing. Uh, when the deed of trust, when you handed it over to them and they failed to give you the money, whose fault is that really? Go ahead and say it, guys. Wrong. <laughs> See, now I just confused the hell out of you. But remember when I was talking about a case earlier, and I said the girl on the stand said, yes, she received the loan. If you have been tricked, is it your fault? No. So in a very tangible, realistic way, it is your fault. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. We've all heard that, and that is a maximum of law, or a maximum of law. Ignorance of a contract is an excuse. Ignorance of a behavior is an excuse. Ignorance of a concept is an excuse, and it's a very viable excuse. Were you falsely led to believe through legalese and lawyers and blah, 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 that you got the loan for the house somehow. Okay, you fell for the trick. One of the things that I try and beat into people's minds when you're in litigation, especially when you're in court, everything is smoke and mirrors. It's the magician and the girl in the bikini. We're going to look at the girl in the bikini. Some of us more than others. But... The, the issue being, you're going to discover nothing there. Not always true, but I'm off on a tangent. You must look at the magician, okay? And you really must look at the magician. Look at what the lie is about, not what you're being led to believe. So when... When you made the mistake of not sitting there and getting the money. Did you do that because you didn't want the money? 
No. You did that because you were falsely led to believe through legal ease that you weren't owed any money. If you're owed money, are you owed money? 